So there we are. Um, and where we are at, okay, um, this is sort of uh, I, the thing that attracted me to open uh, and got me and said, what is this? Where is this? Um, before we can get to the where, I want to do a little bit of the what very briefly and the why is uh, the cost. So 65% of the student body on my campus were an urban community college. 65% um, of the students come from houses with uh, households with a median income of less than $30,000 a year. Um, and that's in New York City. So, and that's a household, not an individual. So that kind of really put into perspective the uh, $150 textbook I had been requiring for Introduction to American Government that really started me here. And it turns out it's not just my textbook that was uniquely expensive. Uh, lots of textbooks uh, are really, really expensive. The cost of textbooks has gone up exponentially. And at the same time as that, we've had um, falling, uh, rapidly falling state and federal disinvestment in higher education, which is leading to this really big crunch on students. So I don't know if you've seen um, probably the textbook broke uh, campaign that every semester, at the start of every semester, students are saying what it is that they can't actually afford or what they can't do because of how expensive textbooks are. Um, and this um, is Integral House. Has anybody seen Integral House? It is one of the most architecturally significant houses uh, in all of North America. It's called Integral House because integrals, like the mathematical thing, uh, was used to construct the curves. The city in Canada that it's in will um, sometimes use it for events. Um, and it was sold for $20 million when the owner uh, who uh, built the house passed away and his estate sold it. It was a $20 million house built by the most popular calculus textbook uh, writer in North America. So um, that's just my little context. So what's one solution? Um, and one of these solutions is OER. So what is an OER? Um, I think since people are still learning and you're gonna get a lot of this, we, we can go a little bit quickly through this. Um, I like UNESCO's, def UNESCO's definition, um, teaching, learning, and research materials that are in, they don't have to be digital, um, that are in the public domain or have been released under an open license. And this is the license question. We're gonna get a little bit radical here. This is just some thinking. There's a lot of, I've been home for weeks with no one to talk to, so I've just been batting around a lot of things in my head and looking online. I'm also a political scientist by training and by, uh, by trade, that's what I teach. So as you might imagine, it's been a super relaxing time to think about things. <laughs> Uh, and the, the five R's that you can remix things, that you can retain things, has been really as uh, articulated by David Wiley. And you can see here, the focus on licensing has been quite extreme. Um, and more than that, not just on the licensing, but the push from Creative Commons to, to really uh, give up, uh, to focus really on that CC BY, right? Because the others are hard to adjudicate, they're hard to enforce, they're, it's a question of what the definitions actually mean. Um, and that some people would say, and this is an image from Cable Green, um, I should say the uh, link, there's another bit.ly for these, and there's Easter egg clickables in everything and citation clickables um, in almost all of the images. So you can play with that later. Uh, but saying that, you know, something that's CC by no derivative is not really OER because you can't remix it, right? Or non-commercial, you can't re, re um, this no derivative makes it absolutely non um, not an OER according to Cable Green's graphic here. And then the, the preference against using non-commercial licenses because they're really hard to define, right? Like, is it commercial if a school wants to recoup the cost of printing for students um, through a small fee? And while I understand those arguments and the focus, I think the license, focus on the license is a really not the only question that matters, right? So it's very clear certain things are very much OER, right? An OpenStax textbook is clearly licensed for um, uh, remix, reuse, retain. You can download that PDF, you can keep it forever. They're even putting their money a lot, where, uh, a lot more where their uh, remix mouth is with the release uh, announced yesterday that, or today, that Google Docs are gonna, there's gonna be Google Docs versions of OpenStax textbooks, which I am really, really excited about um, mm. for reasons I'll tell you later. Um, but there is this question, right? Um, is that it? Uh, and if you're teaching with openly licensed materials or with OER, 
do you want to be limited to just these sorts of things? Because there's a lot of other things out there, right? There's a whole internet full of things. YouTube is great for watching cat videos, but also has been really useful to my teaching. So I have students sometimes create videos, but most of the time I'm sharing videos. It just so happens that the way I like to teach American government, which is what I teach most of the time, um, lines up really nicely with the crash course videos. And not only are they um, really nicely aligned, they're free for students to access, to get to our campus if you don't drive, which a lot of our students do not, um, and a lot of our faculty don't. Uh, you have to take a subway all the way to the end. And since we're on the beach, you can either walk two miles or take a bus two miles. Um, so students have a lot of transit time. A YouTube video actually fits that kind of nicely now that uh, most of New York City's transit system has internet access and everybody has these internet enabled devices. So to then say, well, your course isn't really OER because you use these crash course videos, which by the way are captioned for accessibility and translated it or subtitled into lots of different languages, we have a high English language learner population. Uh, the same thing I've seen with Khan Academy videos and my personal favorite library resources, right? The library has a lot of things. They're not OER. So we get into this debate of OER versus zero textbook cost, right? And then we have this question of sort of the, the faux ER, the pay to play, right? Uh, on the right, you can see there, we've got the Cengage Unlimited, Pearson has a version, MindTap has a version. Um, there's all these um, subscription, right? We'll give you inclusive access. You pay one low, low fee. It starts to sound like um, the Home Shopping Network, right? Uh, mm -hmm. For one low, low fee, you get all the books, all the books that you could ever want, you know, thousands of books. Um, for four months, and hopefully your professor is using them, or your college has already roped your professors into choosing and limiting their academic freedom, their right to their ability to choose what is best for you. And I'll put this, um, I'm not saying that Lumen and Cengage Unlimited are the same thing, because I know Lumen contributes to open resources, but to me as a political scientist, I start to think about so Lumen is, you know, organizations that are not giving things away for free, and they are giving some things away for free, but with the purpose of, you know, finding customers, and that's why they've gotten large amounts of investment, because theoretically something is going to be worthwhile as a business. Um, to say that the, the student's library, we're going to not preference library resources or YouTube as well when those issues are there. So this was sort of my, maybe it's just exhaustion. Um, or not having talked to real people for a while. But what is this open, right? Where is this open and how do we answer it, right? Um, as a political scientist, we have one central organization, right? The American Political Science Association the, the, or the British Political Science Association, if you're there, or the International Studies Association. There are these large organizations that all political scientists belong to. And mostly it's political scientists, maybe some interdisciplinary folk here or there. Open is a very different situation. We don't necessarily have a definition. So what is it? And then always, if we wanna take a, a power analysis, right? When someone tells you what a definition is, why do they think that's the definition, right? Or just something to think about there. Um, but that notwithstanding, um, we do have this evidence that OER students, uh, OER save students a lot of money. This has been published on. I know that you guys are having an event with Virginia Clifton, so she's going to do a much better job talking about her research in these meta-analyses, showing that they save a ton of money, they work just as well or better, or if you feel like being, uh, they work, they're no worse, um, which I still think is a pretty amazing finding um, when you consider the scope of the savings involved. Um, but to figure out what it is, what we're trying to do, and uh, I'm from, I'm part of the City University in New York, we have been the recipients of $12 million over three years from the state, which is an insane amount of money um, that uh, had to be spent in $4 million increments. We didn't know that the next year was coming. Everything had to be spent within that one fiscal year. So it's been very stressful. Uh, it's been very much build the plane while it is crashing and you're going over the cliff, um, that sort of thing. And it's, it's a really nice problem to have. We're really excited to have the problem, but it's a challenge. 
And in that challenge, right, there's also the question of how do you explain to the state what you've done with their money, why they should continue to give you money. There's a lot of data analysis being done on our, all of our campuses. There's a lot of uh, a data analysis they're working to do this centrally. I know SUNY has gotten the same $12 million, but they have 65 campuses. Uh, to their, so they're figuring it out. And a couple of colleagues and I uh, got together and we said, the, the numbers, the data about uh, how many courses are converted, how much money has been saved, what are the grades, what are the dropout rates, that's really important. But we wanted to know uh, what students thought about it. So we have um, what is actually the first open data protocol from the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, on our campus at Kingsborough. And we have, this is fresh, you guys are seeing this for the very first time, um, because I only, I haven't even tweeted the data yet, um, but our openly licensed data protocol, which is at bit.ly slash uh, all capitals, CUNY ZTC, capital S, survey, right? So CUNY ZTC survey, um, and I'll tweet it out later. Uh, we have 3,606 responses, student responses that are all licensed and open for anyone to look at. Um, so here they are. We have a strong amount, and we actually have a really nice combination. Lehman College and Brooklyn College are senior colleges, but they're face-to-face. -face. Um, Lehman is considered a comprehensive. Brooklyn is one of our elites. The CUNY School of Professional Studies is our online school, and Kingsboro is, of course, my community college. We also have, uh, you know, 18 other campuses have at least participated in some way, which is really exciting. Um, one of my questions starting out here was because I work with faculty in Kingsboro, though I love my campus very much, we have a lot of, there's an old school mentality. So uh, I hear from a lot of my colleagues that students can't learn with digital materials. They're always looking at computers. They're always looking at their phones. They're not really reading. And this always cracks me up because how do we engage most with our phones? We're reading, right? Um, so we wanted to ask the students, do you think you learn as well with digital materials? Because that's a real question. Uh, and they said overwhelmingly, yeah, yeah, we do. We definitely do. Um, and this was really important to me to be able to ask because if students don't feel like they do, that's something that would be important to know. And if they do, I'm really glad that they do because whether or not the students, these are all students who were in zero textbook cost courses, but the cheapest way to get most textbooks is a digital rental. So they're reading digitally anyway to interact with those materials, even if they have to buy the, the digital access. Um, these are two uh, questions or the, the results here. Um, and this is from all four semesters, spring and fall 2018 and 2019. Um, when did you first access the book? These make my teacher heart sing, okay? That uh, an, a really big chunk of the students, right? An overwhelming majority accessed before the class started or in the first week of classes. No waiting in line at the bookstore, none of that. Um, and then how much, if you teach guys, if you are, if, uh, my friends, if you, you are teaching regularly, if students, and I know it's self-reported, okay, I get that, but it was anonymous. We didn't collect any identifying data um, that, you know, three quarters almost of students did all of the reading and viewing, all of it. So that's really, that just, that makes my heart sing. Mm -hmm. There is a lot more um, because we, if you want to see a really uh, a finer grained analysis, there's an article in Open Praxis that the IRB team put together, a bunch of us put together on the first um, round. I did a really quick pass at the benefits and you can actually, all of this data is licensed. So if you're starting to say these charts are really simple and there's so much more statistical analysis that could be done here, please do it use it, take it and compare it with um, what's happening on your campus or, or use it as a jumping off point. So that is why we have it openly licensed and we want people to use it and see it and see what they find in it because I want to learn um, what else can be found here. A really quick word cloud of all four semesters. Um, we asked them what the benefits of the class were and a lot of times we talk about OER, right? The conversation moves so much past cost. If you're in a faculty room, if you're at open ed, if you're at a conference, we're talking about customized materials, we're talking about um, identity and, and diversity, inclusion, and equity that we can include in the materials, that it's really the perfect fit, right? It's, it's a, a made to order. For students, overwhelmingly cost is still the thing that gets them. Um, that's if you ask uh, our student population, uh, if you, what was the benefit of this class? They all say cost or almost overwhelmingly cost. So we didn't just ask about good things. 
we asked about the drawbacks. And this is where, again, I, I've checked and double checked the data. I've seen that it's coming from all different campuses. Um, we asked what the drawbacks are, but the biggest answers for the drawbacks were that there were no drawbacks. Um, so you could leave the, the, these were not required, nothing was required. Um, you could say, you could have said nothing, but these are students who wrote either none, nothing, or NA, and that just is really exciting um, to me. Um, again, one way our sort of proxy for what did students really think of this is if you would recommend it to a friend, right? If you liked it, you would recommend it to a friend, and 97.1 of our respondents said that they would. So that to me, that is what, uh, when things get hard or meetings get long or, or budget numbers are hard to crunch, I like to look at this data. Um, there's so much in there um, we, that I'm not really touching here. I really hope that you take a look at it. We asked about printing, we asked about where they access their materials. And in the time that we've been doing this in my own teaching, I've really taken the lesson. So there's the, um, that open practice article that I mentioned includes information, um, the conclusions that we drew that we need to design our materials for printability, accessibility, and device neutrality, which is a tall order because we have students who are looking at computers, we have students who have accessibility needs, we have students who are going to print. Um, it also means a lot of students did mention that they want highlighting or how to annotate, so I've incorporated those types of modeling, how, getting students comfortable if digital is the future, if that's going to be the way that they access material and work with it, I want to make sure that I'm not just assigning them to do it, but that they have some sort of tools to work with that. Um, so again, let's try. I think it might work. If you go to bit.ly uh, slash CSUCI where, um, the same thing, just the second slide to share where you'd like to go with open. So that's sort of where we've been and where the students are. But I'd love to know if this were a road trip, where would we go? I'm gonna cheat and go back and look at the first slide too. Ooh, the future of open ed, that's a really good one. All right, so that's a, a super interesting question. Um, and while you guys work on that second slide, I'll just extemporize a little bit. Uh, it's a collective action problem. So uh, to use any professional society as an example, there is a big American, the Political Science Association runs an annual meeting. It's very expensive. Uh, people sit in little, so it's a conference like any other academic conference. Um, but there is a membership organization um, looking at uh, OER 20, which I'm kicking myself that I cannot go to. Um, there is an organization that has ownership of that, that so open ed was sort of unique in so, for so long because there was no organization. Uh, trying to see, this looks to me like a different form of organizing, right? It's trying to be participatory without individuals. So there are a couple of organizations that have stepped up and said, hey, we, we will sponsor because uh, amorphous groups of, of individual volunteers are really great for ideas, but putting together large scale events is a collective action problem and you need ownership and that sort of stuff. So I am enjoying watching that happen, how and what goes down. I'm also really interested in the proliferation of regional. Um, so in my email box this morning, I saw a call for um, Michigan OER. Uh, Florida's got one, there's one in the Northeast. So seeing these smaller areas that allow for people who maybe don't have the ability, if it comes at a bad time, so open ed last year came at a really bad time, uh, it was Halloween, right? Any other time of the year could be somebody's anniversary or somebody's birthday, a multiplicity of events and um, a lot of conferences, academic conferences do this. So there are smaller regional uh, events in political science. I think that might be interesting as a model um, to see. All right, so let's see. Did it work? Yes, okay, I'm sorry. This, this goes down as a big success, thank you. Um, so balancing the difference between OER, open access, and free to use, does it matter? Um, sustainable mechanisms, this is, these are really good questions, guys. I kinda wanna, I'm gonna go really fast, pardon my talking too fast, because I just wanna talk about these. Um, so I was going back and forth with Karen Cangliosi on Twitter about uh, OER pun names for states. And then we started, I started talking about Mount Rushmore 
or Mount Rush Mopin. Um, so these are four of the people that are really have really influenced my thinking. Um, it's as you can see, uh, Robin DeRosa, Rajiv Jangani, Jesse Stamla, and Mahabali. Um, and this is the direction that I see that is really, really exciting to me. Um, the more open educational practices. That was not an ex exhaustive list, by the way. It's just that there's four people on Mount Rushmore. So I picked the four um, that came to mind first, but I, I'm always sensitive and hesitant to doing it, to picking out individuals. But uh, so we've got um, the Open Pedagogy Patchbook, the Open Pedag Pedagogy Notebook, and Open the Philosophy and Practices. So all of those are clickable if you're not familiar with those resources. They are great um, and they're all free to access. I want to highlight specifically the Montgomery College um, uh, UN, Sustainability, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Fellowship because this is just the coolest idea that Shinta Hernandez has been developing in Maryland and I was able to secure some funding to shamelessly copy it this semester. So we're gonna try to pilot it. It's already been piloted at Kwantlen Polytech. So we're gonna try and do a version of our own as well at Kingsboro. Um, so this type of idea, I'm gonna highlight, this is one of, there's Wikipedia edit-a-thons, the idea of creating student-created content, um, student-created work that has an authentic audience, that has a real purpose. And this can take, it's, it's really hard to define for me. So again, this where is open, what is open. I can't give you a, a polished definition of what is open pedagogy, because if you can say something is open pedagogy, I want to listen to the argument that you can make that it is. Um, I happen to like this. This is um, from Dr. Mary Ortiz who is a biologist at Kingsborough. She is a self-professed non-technical person. She's one of my absolute favorite people in OER though, because she is not a technical person, but she, that didn't stop her from getting into it. Um, and what she has done is created a lab manual for vertebrate biology. Uh, it's a lab course. I made the mistake of always meeting with her when we were working on this right before lunch. So we would just be looking at cut open dissected critters um, which turned my stomach, but she's like, if I could do something like that, I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, if we could get the labels, I was like, oh, I can do the labels or we can have our, our teaching and learning staff help you with the labels. If you have the pictures of the cut open things. And she said, without having read any of those open pedagogy resources, I just highlighted, she's like, why don't I have the students do them? So now um, you can see that there's student credit. So students have the option of taking a photo and competing for extra credit or taking a quiz. Guess what they all pick. Um, and then in the process of quizzing, uh, Dr. Ortiz has or the process of uh, analyzing her grades that it turns out that really ta carefully taking photos and labeling them carefully, they actually learn more uh, than they would if they were um, just taking a quiz or cramming for a quiz. So I think that's really cool. And again, which do you think, so this is a sketch from just a, a regular vertebrate biology, which if you were tasked with cutting open the, the little fishy there, um, would help you more, right? It's gotta be the full color photo. And I love that you can see just a little bit of the background of as a, as a student to be able to see like, hey, that's the classroom I'm in. That chair is right over there. I think that's great. Um, so where am I trying to go um, with this open pedagogy, which does not come naturally to me. I'm a survivor of 20 years of Catholic school, uh, and it is very, political science is a really conservative discipline too. So uh, the idea of sort of blogging and student creation and editing um, and sort of, you know, not using necessarily maybe a peer reviewed textbook, but a student written textbook or having students edit something that's already gone through peer review to change it, right? All of that is anathema to everything I've trained with, but uh, a friend actually just asked me recently why I'm bothering with it because I struggle. It doesn't come naturally. And I said, well, it turns out what I was doing wasn't working. It wasn't working for the students. It wasn't working for me. So why keep doing it? And I'm very lucky. I, I was tenure track. As of September, I'll be tenured. Um, I have the privilege to actually try to do some different things. Uh, so I feel like that is, that is where I'm at. So I'm working now, um, inspired again by a lot of those people on that Mount Rushmore, uh, Mount Rushmore ER, uh, on blogging, on grading, and choosing your own adventure. So I am, I am a, a late convert to blogging, um, both for student work and for uh, my own stuff, but it's really like blowing my mind and it's really 
quite funny to say, oh man, have you heard about this great thing that started 15 years ago and I'm finally catching on to, but uh, so it is. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the uh, adventures, uh, or one of the things I'm really excited about is this OpenStax issuing their books as Google Docs. So previously, if you wanted to edit an OpenStax book, you could sort of use their CNX pl platform, but it was clunky. Um, uh, BC Open Canvas it took the chance, or uh, took the time to put together some books into um, a Pressbooks installation so you could edit them that way. But again, you have to know Pressbooks isn't, I wouldn't say Pressbooks is hard, but it's not as easy as a Google Doc, which every single student of mine uses for their writing assignments anyway, as well as I do my own. Uh, and then my other issue, uh, looking, there are two sort of things that looking at uh, student equity and diversity. So there, I, I linked a really good webinar. I can't say anything better than what they say there. So just go watch that. Um, and I, I ran a little um, uh, model. So they use hugs in that example. I did professor. Um, and if you take time now to, to Google professor, just image, right? And look for the non-commercial reuse ones. I don't think it's gotten any better. There are some uh, movements now to create stock footage and then uh, openly licensed stock footage of more diverse populations, but it is a slow process. So making sure that in moving into OER, we don't reify um, any of those other problems, right? That the pictures or the, the topics are only of dominant social classes, dominant racial ethnic classes. Um, and really that, dovetails where I, I got into OER so I could teach political science more effectively so my students would have access to the books so we could talk about political science and now what I really want to do is get political science to talk about OER so I've come really full circle back on that. I've got a couple of projects going on on that right now. Um, one that I'm hoping to, to bring out fairly soon is uh, looking at this, this picture. Uh, I compared American government textbooks with uh, OER textbooks as well as traditionally published textbooks to see what their representation of historically marginalized groups. And I assumed because I love OER that the OER textbooks would be better and it was not guys. I'm, I am sorry to say it was not. Um, but it's interesting in that so I can talk more about that. Um, you can make them better. So let me look quickly here. Update this slide. Right. So that's our, the impact of affordability and also the pedagogical impact of OER. And how can we support the, the ooh, all right. So I would like to dedicate before I show you this slide with your face there, um, because that is one of the things that's great about open, right? Is that it's not a reified sort of situation. If I wanna become the world's greatest political scientist and the world's most well-known political scientist, I have to not only do incredible work, but then I have to get all these other people to recognize it, um, where open is quite literally more open. So if you are doing incredible work, people will find you um, and, and lift you up. And then I get to quote and just shamelessly copy from you, um, but in a way that you have licensed and said is okay. Um, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna shrink this back. How am I doing? I'm doing okay on time because you guys have some really interesting Questions. Let's go back and, and make this a conversation if we can. Is that okay? It sounds good to me. Ah, <laughs> it's exciting my, to see people. I had to get my stuff turned on here. Um, this was fabulous. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciated your passion and realistic perspective on where we're going. I think one of the challenges here at Channel Islands that we face is how do we define this to make it measurable? And so that affordability, low cost piece seems to be the most tangible thing. I, I wrote um, the comment about looking at the impact of affordability, but also the pedagogical impact. And I think there is something unique there, like the example of the dissections of the fish and the students labeling that we haven't done a very good job measuring. And um, coming out of education and special education, I've looked at that stuff in depth. And I think that the power of that um, to close equity gaps, if we're intentional about it, and to improve student learning understanding, 
and for them to become digital citizens is powerful. But I don't know that we've nailed it yet quite as much as we have looking at affordability matters, you know, and it's easy to measure. So. So this is a really interesting point. Uh, I don't know that we have, there's the sort of quick, quick argument to, or response to say, the way that we communicate with each other is through scholarly journal articles. That's our language, right? So doing, running more um, social studies, writing more about this, speaking more about this, what you're doing and trying to get other people to say, hey, we have those conversations, whether they're in written form or in person to person. Um, but the, the bigger question there is that we haven't made that case. We're not gonna make that case. Um, and that's a really tough one. Uh, if at OER 19 last year, so Su Min Koo gave this really great keynote. I think it's still online that you can find it. Um, and one thing that really stuck with me was this idea of uh, arm shells, not spreadsheets, right? So she goes through this whole thing about how different groups, um, they give you an arm shell, so they are an armband so that you are marked as part of the community, right? And what are we trying to do? We're trying to make our students learners, members of the community of learners. And, and what do we do? And this, I'm so very guilty of this because I love a spreadsheet. Like Google Sheets is my life. I love it. I do, I'm, my Christmas card list is in Google Sheets, right? And my to-do <laughs> list is in Google Sheets. I love it. Everything is in Google Sheets. But then I realized, do I want my students to be compliant little boxes that fit neatly in the cells that I have pre-made for them. And if they don't fit in that, then I have nothing for them, right? So this is a, I think a, a radical culture shift that has to happen, right? And some of us, right, in academia, we have been very good at making neat boxes, right? Someone gave us the list of neat boxes we need to fit in. So we crammed ourselves in there and now we're supposed to cram the next generation into them. And I think, I hope what we're gonna do is say, we're not gonna cram. Um, but that is a really hard conversation, especially since every pressure in every public institution and most of the private ones is saying, no, you got to cram. You got to cram them tighter. You've got to show that um, they are making more progress, that this is doing better with less human hours and with less money. And you have to do better to just get the same resources that you got, not even to get more resources, right? We have a big push now called 15 to finish. Um, and I know some places in California have had that. And the math is solid, right? If you take more credits you will, and you pass them, you will fit. But the end you pass them is not on the poster, right? 15 to finish, save more of your financial aid for your four-year school or, or graduate sooner. All of that makes sense, but it's not relevant. It's not appropriate to so many of my students, right? I have a lot of students I have to say, look, I know you're taking these classes, but you're also working 60 hours a week, or you're working 40 hours a week and you have childcare responsibilities or other caring responsibilities. You are a human being. You cannot do more than what a human, and you have set yourself up. So I, I think it's, it's on all of us uh, to, to sort of fight those impulses and to make the case that, you know, uh, the, money, the money is good. I wanna capture that money, right? So on our campus, Students, it's interesting to me that so many, especially the, the students on my campus, find the financial aspect that the textbooks are free because the overwhelming majority of our student population doesn't pay for their own textbooks. It's either through financial aid or they get vouchers, right? So they get um, through different programs, ASAP um, and other programs that are on campus that cover their books, but, um, or they get stipends to cover their books. But the A, the cost is still important for them and B, to me, what I wanna see is somehow to capture the money that was being spent by the campus and by those organizations on books, right? That goes to the sustainable position, right? Let's make something so we get fellowships for people on campus. And rather than paying a consultant or, or, or subscribing to an inclusive access, right? If you multiply out that inclusive access and you say, okay, we could keep if it's $25 per student, and there's you know, 3,000 students in that sector enrolled in sections of that course, instead of giving that to an inclusive access deal or, or to a, a courseware or anything like that, let's keep that on campus. Let's pay faculty, let's play contingent faculty especially, right? If we, we need to fight to get those people living wages anyway, but in the, in the meantime, let's pay to get them paid to do the work that they're already doing. Um, so that's my... 
not short answer. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're singing my, my song there. I, I agree with you completely. Um, I think there, there is a reason to measure the affordability Absolutely. And bringing those resources back to campus. I, I do think it's interesting when you look at it. I'm not certain what happens with our students who are on financial aid. I think the money goes to them. I don't believe we have vouchers. So it is actually in their pocket savings. Um, but I'm going to have to ask a little bit more because most of our students or a lot of our students are getting uh, financial aid and what mm -hmm. have you that covers the cost. But even when the financial aid that comes, especially if it comes to you directly, it's not a voucher that you have to use. If you have rent or food or other needs, then students are making that choice. And we know they're making that choice, right? We've got Babson survey. Um, I have a short video that I did with students at Kingsborough and they really, to hear them say definitely, and I'm not the only person who has had a video like that. You see students decide, well, I get to choose between a textbook and it's, it's heartbreaking, right? So Let's, let's make that choice a little easier in the short term. This is so great to see. Okay, let's see. Anybody other, other questions? How can we support faculty to publish open? Anybody wanna claim that? I can claim it. Um, Jamie, I'm at the hospital, so I might have to chat in a moment, but I just was thinking um, there's a lot of faculty that aren't interested in publishing open because they feel like it's either not as valuable, won't be as valued. Um, we've talked a lot, a little bit at Channel Islands about trying to support faculty and figuring out avenues to even think about paying maybe or getting um, some accommodations towards partial costs for publishing some of the articles open right so that that's still in a journal maybe that's considered valid for their discipline or mm -hmm. it's going to get credit for them but then it's not really a long-term sustainable plan and and then there's some faculty that are interested in publishing open but i i think that's a hard road to go down because i don't know i don't know if they feel the value is going to be in return right? It's like an unknown, depending on what the end product is. And I think that's Absolutely. scary for people. It's so how really do you help scary. support them take those risks? So it's a whole, again, we got to, we got to change the whole system from the top because um, I actually, uh, as, as you heard at the beginning, I have published a book. I'm very proud of it. And in the total royalties of the book that took my entire year, I could take one of you out to a nice dinner. If we don't have any wine and we go to like Shake Shack, I could maybe take two of you. Um, <laughs> so the, the system is worked, uh, is based on, uh, especially in uh, academics at public institutions, which is a, a lot of us, right? That we are paid by taxpayer dollars to think and to write and to share that, to do important research, right? And get that information out there. And then that value, we actually have to, we give it to, because you need to, right? You need to publish or perish. And you need to publish, not just publish, but you need to publish high impact. You need to publish in one of the three good journals. Um, I imagine that medicine is even more competitive than but political science. We think we're really fancy, but like literally no one will die because of what we say. So, but in your case, they actually will, right? That's really important. So at your college, you guys have to pay uh, publishers to get back the research that you gave them for free, right? So, and if you wanna publish open access, so okay, it's great that the, the publishers are extremely adaptable. They have seen this. They do not like it when we share our papers together. They say, okay, you can do it open access, but you're gonna have to pay us three grand a pop. So you can get that. And then, so wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm gonna give you the paper for free you're going to sell it to other people. I'm going to pay you $3,000 so that other people can see it. And this is, this is a really interesting experiment that is happening in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom caught on to this a little bit faster and said, hey, wait a minute. If research is funded publicly, like if it's from grants, it's from uh, you know, the NHS or anything, then it has to be published openly. Um, and all grants must include open access fees. So that was their first evolution of this. And they realized how much of their money was being siphoned off instead of into research into these OA fees. And they said, okay, no, um, it still needs to be public. Uh, we're not paying for it. And they're not allowed to charge you anymore. 
So I think the more of us that can, so right now um, there are academics who make a, pub, a, 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 a promise that they're not going to publish anything that isn't open, right? And I think that's awesome. Uh, I'm, now that I'm achieved tenure, I am making that promise. I have one more book project that I'm working on that had started well before I was really, it's a slow one, man. <laughs> um, and, and what I'm really trying to figure out now is how am I gonna publish that? And people do publish books openly and they get read more and they get shared more. And this isn't even more, uh, as a political scientist, I'm not an Americanist, I'm an international relations person. So the, if it's expensive for our institutions in the United States to pay for access to this research, so these big deals from El Sevier and everyone else that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to get back the research that we gave them for free, right? How much does it cost a medical school in Ghana or in Egypt? right? It's, it's absolutely untenable, right? That institutions that needed um, during Ebola outbreaks, right? Or if you think about countries that don't have access, uh, you know, when coronavirus, like let's be very, you know, the research that is relevant to that, you could say, okay, well, we can use our hospital's entire budget to get these two articles, or we can go without the most up-to-date science, or we can try and, and email the, the scientists directly who published it and see if they'll shadily send it to us. So the whole system from stem to stern needs to change. Um, in that sense, I think publishing open is really good. And then that feeds the open ecosystem, right? The more of us that publish open, the more people who can teach with things that, have, that are open and available, right? The, you know, in a couple of in a generation, all of the really good stuff, the iconic stuff that's being published now will be open, hopefully, right? So then no one will be able to say, and I teach at a community college, I teach the intro classes. I've spoken with a lot of people um, in my discipline at conferences and at the senior colleges around New York that say, well, that's great for intro, but I'm not gonna not teach the best new articles to my students just because they're free, right? And I get that, right? We don't wanna have tiered access of the really good stuff for the people who can pay and then eh, eh, for the people who can't pay. Um, so can feeding that. Sorry. No, go ahead. Can I ask you a quick question? I, I don't know if you know the details of what's happening in the UK, um, but how are they managing the peer review process? Because that's really how I've interpreted the open access fees is it's kind of a fee to manage the peer review process. So if they're you, not paying those. Um, have you ever been paid for a peer review? No, no, no. I got to go then do that. There's somebody managing the process, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what as we've spoken to our publishers, that that's kind of how they're selling it, which it is a process to be managed, right? What that It's a process to be managed. And but what so, yeah, so in the UK scenario, who's doing the, the peer reviewing? I mean, or, or is that, do you know? And I don't know yeah. what's going far enough along, but. So this is, this is a really interesting question. Um, I can speak to the um, journals in my discipline, right? So uh, one I'm very familiar with is the Journal of Political Science Education. It's a closed journal. Um, I know the editors. So I submit something into their system. A lot of this has gone through automation, right? So they get something in their system. They send it out to reviewers. Um, it comes back to them. They synthesize the reviews, send it to me. Uh, there is copy editing at the end, but even Taylor and Francis doesn't do that copy editing. And Rutledge didn't do it for my book. They've outsourced it to other companies in lower income, um, sort of uh, the, for my first book, it was in the, I communicated with someone in Chennai um, who was a Rutledge subcontractor. So those same sorts of, if, if they want to say, that it's really, you know, so difficult for us. So few of their personnel are touching it that I, I would love someone to make that argument to my, that, like share the books, right? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not really making an, an argument. I'm just kind of asking a question. So if, if they're saying we're not paying your fees anymore, do they have a different place that they're publishing or are they just telling the company, sorry, you have to publish this without us paying you anything? You know, mm -hmm. I just right now in the US, you know, we, if you have publicly funded, federally funded research and have the results have to be open access. So we're, you know, we're paying those fees and I'm wondering if we took those fees away, where, where does the research get published then and, and who manages that? 
because that's a system we have set up. But I'm wondering if it's an opportunity to change the system. And Put the university presses, right? So the, the journal article, journals used to be managed in academic departments. The editor was, they, they would get the mailed submissions and they would farm it out through their grad students to mail them out, right? And that was so onerous that publishers came in and they hoovered them all up and they said, we'll make it so much easier for you. You won't have to deal with that. You just do the sciencey part that we can't do um, and we'll handle all the details. But they have extorted such an increasing amount for it. Uh, was it Stanford or one of the UCs? I'm sorry, you guys probably know better than I, who said to Elsevier, Yeah, all of our scientists give you research. We don't want to pay $500,000 a year per library to get back our own research. So either you cut us a better rate or you don't get any of our research anymore. And that's the sort of thing, because without academics wanting to publish in journals, they don't have anything. But you're right, it is, it is a really big channel, uh, challenge, and it is a question of looking at, um, it's the same thing when we talk with faculty about switching to OER, right? If you have to change your textbook, you do have to change things, right? And maybe you have to tweak some stuff, but it's the same thing you have to do when you get a new edition, right, of a, of a book. We don't have a sales rep calling and walking you through it. Um, but then again, they don't call you at nine o'clock on the day after New Year's either, which is what Top Hat did to me. It was not my favorite. Thank you. No problem. I, I, I could keep asking you questions all day, but I'll see if anyone else has them. <laughs> I see we have about five minutes left. Are there any other questions still out there or any questions on the screen there that you would, any others you'd like to tackle, Shauna? Hmm. Let's see. Supporting faculty to publish open. Um, one other thing I would love to see um, in the publishing of research. Yeah, we, we have talked of, about that system. I would love to see support or recognition for um, creating and using OER and getting it not just of you're a champ, we're so proud of you, or recognizing um, I started working on OER before we had this grant, before it was really a thing in CUNY. And what I was going to do is I knew I was gonna spend some time on it. So I wrote a grant to run a study uh, and then publish an article about the study because my tenure and promotion guidelines specifically acknowledge or accept scholarship of teaching and learning, which a lot of the senior colleges in CUNY don't, but mine does. So I knew that making a whole book, if it was for a textbook, uh, for, for a classroom use, would not count towards tenure and promotion, doesn't get me anything. But an article about it would get me something. Changing those tenure and promotion guidelines to acknowledge that maybe, right, we wanna encourage people if you have a textbook. So I, I do show that slide of integer house because I am inherently a spiteful New Yorker, right? I'm just a cranky person that if you charge it, like, I'm, do we have any mathematicians, right? We can speak freely. Has calculus changed that much? Has it? I mean, it's been a minute since I took it, but it seems like, you know, it's not that that day to day, the numbers are changing so that to keep reissuing new additions with tiny little changes and with the subscription fees right now for courseware access that you can't buy use that you have to buy new every semester, um, to, to sort of acknowledge that we want faculty, we want to support faculty doing that and not just, and say, this is part of its service to your discipline, its service to your college. One university in um, Canada actually has specifically included um, use of OER in their tenure and promotion guidelines. So you are recognized that ticks a box for you um, of the many different boxes you can serve. And if you think about it, I, I don't know about you guys, uh, but I have sat on several committees that are just make work because we all need to have committees, right? Everybody has to show their service and tick those boxes. So if instead of having so many people on those committees, we said open is, is a goal, we want to see people working on that and to, to pass that, and that's something we can really work on locally, okay? The big systemic changes, we have to advocate for that in our systems, in our faculty senates, in our state houses, in our academic uh, organizations, right? But tenure and promotion um, guidelines, that we can advocate for in our departments. 
in uh, our promote our PND boards, those sorts of things. So there's work to be done everywhere that doesn't really have anything to do with our actual discipline. So I'm talking to anyone who is tenured, right, or or who who has some institutional power. This is one of the fights. There's a lot of really good, important fights to use it on, but this is one of them, and it's going to need a lot of people. Well, Sean, maybe one, maybe one wrap-up question. We only have about three minutes left. I'm wondering, you've talked about where Open's been, and we're now we're talking about where we see it going in the future. What's like maybe immediate next steps for us as people boots on the ground to take it to the next level? Some a challenge you might have or a vision. You a have. challenge. So I I want to say this question. I, I want everyone to think about this. Figure out what you want to do. Is there something that lights your fire, and do it right. So we can't all do massive things, but we can all do something. And if we all do something, it ends up being massive. Um, so there are ways to to meet up. And I don't know everybody's discipline. And even if I did, I have a lot of opinions and I'm very good at telling people what to do. But one of the things I'm trying to learn is that um, we're going to go a lot further together. So try. I can't tell you what to do or where to go. I want to see, I want to follow where you all go, right? So so Channel Island is on my my radar now, especially since my sister lives in LA. So now I'm like, all right, Channel Island, I see you. I'm, I'm going to keep watching and, and see this go. And I know you guys have OpenCI, which is very cool. You, you, it seems like I, I saw your week of events. Um, that is, you guys are well positioned and well supported. So I, I want to, you know, do something, go somewhere and then send me a postcard and tell me all about it. <laughs> yeah, I like that though. Small actions about each of us or something we're passionate and inspired by. And yeah, let that build. So thanks. We're you know technically out of time, so you know we got thirty seconds left, maybe. So I just don't want to go over on your time and your respect. I know you have other things on your schedule. So just thanks so much for speaking with us. So you brought all your your knowledge and insight, but I think I'm more impressed by the passion and energy and uh, inspiration you're bringing. So I know I for one really appreciate it. I want to give you like a round of applause on how that works on Zoom, if we can clap or not. Or, but I but appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate the audience. I appreciate having people to talk with about this. Mm -hmm. and how about we close with an open invitation to visit Channel Islands? If you ever mm -hmm. come out and see your sister, we'd love to have you on campus. Don't don't say things like that to me. <laughs> you really should not. Is the thing. Don't visit. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, so thanks a lot. I'm sure we'll all be in touch moving forward. I encourage anyone. I see some people on Zoom that I don't recognize their names. That's a good thing. So I can only assume we've got four or five continents covered here. Be sure and follow Shauna on uh, you know, Twitter and elsewhere, Professor Brandel, Prof Brandel. And thanks again. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.